In this lesson, we're going to be looking to solve a problem that pops up a lot in numerical analysis. The tool we're going to be using to solve this is known as the bisection method. What we're trying to solve is simply finding a x value for an equation that solves that equation. So in this case, we're going to have x squared minus e to the x is equal to negative 5. And we're going to try and solve that equation for x. Now, the first thing we need to do is actually change this equation around a little bit because our method specifies that we need a function that we are going to solve for 0. So this is an easy fix. All we need to do here is just move this negative 5 to the left-hand side of the equation. And so we can say that our function here is equal to x squared minus e to the x plus 5. Now, this is a two-step process. And our first step is known as bracketing. And what bracketing means is that we are trying to find a region where in some point in there, our function is equal to 0. And there are two ways of doing this. The first and probably the simplest is just to do it graphically. So if we know our function, we can usually plot that function. Plotting our function here yields something that looks like a parabola on the left-hand side of x equals 0, and then kind of crosses into negative e to the x filling that in. We're interested in this region of space uh, right here, which is around x equals 2 and x equals 3. Now, we don't actually need to plot this. We can actually just do this algorithmically. And the way we would say this is that we're going to loop through or check an entire list of x values until we find two evaluations of this function. So we would say f of xi to refer to the current position of our x and the position adjacent to that, f of x i minus 1, let's say. And we'll multiply those two together. And if we multiply them and they are greater than 0, if they are positive, that means that either both of these values are positive or both values are negative. If this is less than or equal to 0, then we know that we are hitting a region where one of these values is positive and the other is negative. So this is an algorithm that we can do that we can avoid this manual process of graphing the plot. So once we have a bracket, once we know uh, some values, here we could choose 2 and 3 as our initial x values. We could assign this value as x1. And the corresponding function would be f1. This value here, we would call x2. And we could call the corresponding function f2. Once we have those, we start the process of bisection. So we assume that we've done our bracketing. And out of our bracket comes this x1 and x2 alongside our f1 and f2 values. So we're saying that we know all of those values as we start the bisection. Now, the core of the bisection is finding the new x value that we're going to evaluate. So this x new, that I'm going to call it, is simply the central point of our values. So this is x1 plus x2 divided by 2. It's the, it's the average of these. So let's take this graph over here and zoom in on this region. So I'm going to plot the area between 2 and 3 a little more close up. And so we have high curvature there, and then it kind of evens out and gets a little straighter. We said that this was our x1, which evaluated up to our f1. This was our x2, which evaluated to f2. Now our new value, I'm going to call this x3 for this plot. We will take that and we'll need to evaluate this function as well. So our next step here is to go ahead and evaluate an f new. So in this case, it'll be f3. 
So that's our next step. We're going to take this new x value that we found and calculate a new f value to go along with it. S is the evaluation of our function at this position x new. All right, at this point, we have two different possibilities. The first possibility is that our function crosses the x axis in between the points x1 and our x new. The other possibility is that it's between x2 and x new. So we need to account for both of those possibilities. For possibility one, let's say that this occurs when f new multiplied by f1 is less than zero. So this means that our f new is positive or negative, and our f1 is the opposite. So in this case, let's say that f1 is positive, that would mean our f new is negative. That's obviously not the case here, so let's go ahead and write the other option. Our other option is that f nu times f2 is going to be less than zero. All right, so what do we want to do in this case? In this situation, we know that our actual crossing point lies in between our new x location and x2. So if we want to repeat this process, do the same thing over again, and refine our guess, we need to set our new points as these two values instead of our original two values. So x2 doesn't need to change. It can stay exactly as it is. But x1 needs to switch to our x new. So we're going to set x1 equal to x new and overwrite that value. And we're going to set f f1 equal to f new so that we can carry that along as well. So if this is what we need to do here, the other option, if it's in the other interval, we'll have to set this as x2 equal to x new, overriding x2 instead, right? We're saying that it's in this region instead. And f2 will be equal to f new. Now, whatever the case, whatever happens, we'll need to evaluate what our error is. And we'll talk about exactly what our error is going to be in a moment. So let's assume that we can calculate that for a second. We have two options here as well. The first off is if our error is less than uh, whatever tolerance we set. We want to determine how close we actually want to get to the correct answer. So if we're less than or equal to our tolerance, then we can choose an x value based on our two guesses and be done. But if we are greater than our tolerance, that means that we need to head back to determine another new value. All right, so let's figure out what this epsilon is going to be. And it actually depends on how we define x over here. If we choose x is equal to x1 or x2, which are perfectly valid options, then we know that we have an error that is a maximum of the difference between those two values. But we can just set it to the new midpoint, right? We can just take the midpoint again. And then we know that the max we're going to be off is uh, half the distance between these two values. We take x2 and x3, and we actually set x equal to this value. The worst that can happen is that we are half the distance between x2 and x3 away. We're going to set this epsilon equal to the absolute value of x2 minus x1 divided by 2. That's half of our current interval, whatever that is. So let's run through a few more steps of this and just kind of see how this plays out. We found our first x new at x3, right? Well, f new is greater than zero. f2 is less than zero. And so we know that we're bracketed between this x new and x2. This is 2.5 and 3, right? Our new value, our x4, is going to be midway in between those two points. So x4 is 2.75. Now f4 here, if we evaluate that, is going to be less than zero. We don't want our interval in between these two points because they're both less than zero. We want our interval here. So we'll take the current x1, right? We replaced x1 with this x new, and this will replace our x2. So we can keep going down this road and keep on refining our estimate. But that's the path that we'll take. Now, one nice thing about this is that we can get a really good estimate of what our error is uh, as we progress through the process, right? So if we've bisected, 
we know what our error is for each step. So for the first step, it's just going to be whatever our initial x1, x2 is, right? If we are between x1 and x2, then our error, if we pop out over here, is just going to be our initial x1 minus x2 divided by 2. The next time we go through, our interval has been cut in half. So e2 is just going to be equal to e1 divided by 2. And e3, of course, is just going to be e2 divided by 2, which is e1 over 4. And so we can write that e to the n is going to be equal to our initial error estimate multiplied by 2 to the negative n. And so I need to say this as e0. And we'll define e naught here as x1 minus x2. So if e naught here is our initial bracketing distance, then each time we run through this iteration, our error is going to decrease by a factor of 2. So that's the method. I hope you all have fun coding it up.